Good morning. Welcome to the first high rounds we've had in person. It's lovely to see people. As you can see, this is a truly hybrid rounds. We have some people in person and we have some on Zoom. We were hoping our speaker would be in person, but unfortunately got stuck at the border. So this is truly going to be hybrid rounds because he's actually going to be presenting on Zoom. So I have the great honor today to present, uh, to introduce Professor Roman Chavez Mendez. Professor Chavez Mendez is a really extraordinary person and I've had the privilege of getting to know him and starting to work with him with Chip Schooley through the Global Education School and through a nonprofit specialist in global health to help identify additional educational opportunities for his graduate students at the University, the Autonomous University of Baja California. Professor Roman Chavez Mendez is passionate about molecular epidemiology and molecular diagnostics. He was trained at WAVC. He's a very interesting person because there are some people who, when you see them in the lab and when you've worked for a while in a really good basic science lab, you know that there are just some people who have what they call the hands. People with the hands, somehow they can make techniques work, somehow with new machines, new sequences, when other people can't get it to go, they go. So it turns out that yes, Professor Chavez Mendez was trained at WAVC, but during his graduate training, he actually introduced to WAVC a lots of techniques, lots of methodologies that the university didn't actually have before. So when you see him rise through the ranks, as you can imagine of, epidemia, of academia, he has been much in demand across the campus with skills in genomics and molecular biology. He has positions within biomedical engineering, medicine, pharmacology. He has mentored multiple graduate students. His research work has been presented at international conferences. He's collaborated, of course, with uh, Davy Smith and uh, Sanjay Mehta at UCSD. Dr. Chavez Mendez is gonna to present today about the social response to TB in Tijuana. And I think it's gonna be a very interesting vision for us because he is a deeply immersed biologist. He's a molecular biology expert, a genomics expert, but you will see from his presentation that his responses and what needs to be done have been rooted in the social needs he sees around him. It's my privilege, oh, uh, and part of those social needs are going to be focused on a place called Las Memorias, which is a residential facility for persons with HIV, TB, and drug abuse. And it's my distinct privilege to introduce Professor Roman Chavez Mendez. Thank you, Dr. Sarah, for such a nice presentation for myself thinking I'm gonna start doing the presentation so I, it, it doesn't take uh, long. So I'm gonna talk uh, about the social res response we have uh, done to try to fight tuberculosis in Tijuana. So, so can change the, uh, okay. Tuberculosis is uh, an airborne, uh, airborne infectious disease and it affects uh, disproportionately populations along the US and Mexico border, as you can see on this map. You can see the, um, the incidence uh, of TB on the uh, US side and the incidence on the Mexican side. It is not proportionally distributed um, uh, along the, along the uh, border. You know, the Mexican side is really has a, a big uh, incidence in co comparison with the US states. The highest uh, US state with uh, the highest incidence is uh, California and San Diego, but on uh, and, uh, and the highest state and the, the state with the highest incidence is uh, Baja California, which is where Tijuana is. And as you can see, Mexico has a national TV incidence of 15.7 um, cases 
per 100,000 population. And on Tijuana, we, in the state, we have 57 patients as an incidence. And in Tijuana, we have had as high as 74 patients per 100,000. So Tijuana is the city with the highest incidence of TB in compare that with uh, the US is not proportionate. It's, uh, it's, we have almost 10 times probably uh, the incidence of San Diego, the closest city, US city to us. And it's been like that for decades. It's been a long time since we, since I remember. So, uh, and also the Tijuana is the city with the highest incidence of uh, drug resistant cases. So uh, the TB detection, housing, prevention, and treatment of availability in the US and Mexico is also uh, very, very different. On the US side, uh, every jurisdiction has developed solutions to assist patients with TB. If a patient, as you, know, you all know, if you got a patient with TB, you, uh, the city uh, even rents a, a hotel room to have them and, and give them treatment. And you have really rapid diagnosis. You can do drug susceptibility, susceptibility testing and and access to curative treatment very fast on the Mexican side is not like that. We have uh, some uh, problems in order to get to that. Treatment is universally available, and but we can almost only get uh, medicine called Dogbal, which is it, Dogbal has uh, four of the of the medicines of the molecules that the uh, uh, for treatment for TB. And housing and laboratory TB detection is also scarce. There, there are some shelters in Hermosillo, which is a, a state uh, next to Baja California, and Sonora, in Ciudad Juarez, in Chihuahua, but they provide very limited housing. In Tijuana, there's the only uh, place that exists that can give a shelter for TB patients, uh, and it's called Las Memorias. I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, in the uh, next uh, slides about the house, the Las Memorias house. But we can give uh, Las Memorias, we give uh, limited TB detection, as, as you will know in a little bit also. The TV control in San Diego and Tijuana, TV does not recognize borders as we all know, but Tijuana is the hotspot in, in the area. We are the hotspot of TV in Mexico and we are the hotspot of the TV in the US too, because we're close to, to the US. Genotyping of the of TV isolates reveals linkage between strains of, on both sides of the border. It tells us that uh, people are going in and out between the two, uh, between the two countries and TV is also uh, traveling with them. So uh, limiting TV transmission within Tijuana, high risk communities will reduce the high incidence on both sides of the border and will reduce the number of people who become ill in Tijuana and go to the US and, and try to find care, medical care. So um, in Tijuana, TV in Tijuana, uh, there are some uh, needs we have uh, we have detected. We need timely detection. We need uh, to do things fast. We need to detect the cases faster. We need to increase detection methodologies. Most of the uh, detections we do in the city uh, are based on on staining, which is a very very uh, cheap technique, but it is not the best, it's also actually the worst technique that can be used. So, uh, but we still rely on it. Uh, we need to increase the, the type of methods we use. Also, we need to improve the management of detect them and, and get them into treatment faster. Uh, 
and we need successful prevention. We are the the city with the highest uh, incidence in the whole country, and and we have been like that for 20, 30 years since I remember. And uh, and we need we need uh, better uh, strategies to do prevention in the city. And between other things, we we need. Uh, what have we what have we done so far to try to stop TV from being the 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 uh, being Tijuana being a hotspot for TV in Mexico? We have done in at the Autonomous University of, of uh, Baja, UABC. We have uh, built a tuberculosis laboratory. We have a lab. Uh, this uh, design only to work with TV, where we can do uh, uh, acid fat fast staining. We can do lowest and Jensen culture. We can do PCRs since we don't have a, a gene expert. We develop a, a technique by simple PCR endpoint PCR and and detect IS sixty one ten to detect. Uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and uh, we have uh, done it since a uh, long time, several years, and we were using it instead of uh, experts uh, since we don't have the equipment yet. But uh, we also have grown this lab to do a uh, liquid culture sensitivity testing, but we're going to be able to do it soon because we have only finished the the uh, building the remodel for uh, BSL three, so we there's still something that we need to do still to it, but we are we are able to use it right now and soon, probably uh, before this year ends, we're gonna have we're gonna be able to do this testing uh, at that lab, and also we can do direct sequence analysis for mutation mutation detection because we have a small eye from Illumina we can we can use to uh, do a uh, mutation detection by uh, by sequence by genome sequence so uh, and also at, at this lab we since we saw that the not only detection is needed to combat tuberculosis in Tijuana we also do uh, TV prevention. We have a social media information distribution in the in the city. We have a YouTube channel with some videos that we show. We have a Facebook. We have uh, where we go to places such as in Las Memorias and other places as the Secretaria de Salud and other places where we, we teach uh, people uh, about tuberculosis. Uh, we also have uh, community health campaigns, uh, as I was telling you. And we also do these uh, flyers. We have these flyers uh, distributed all over the, the city. Uh, students from UABC uh, do social service and they design these flyers and we give them, we print them and we give them and uh, put them in hospitals and clinics and, and pharmacies everywhere we can we can go sometimes we go to the flea market and and distribute them where where we know there's a lot of TV there's there's places there uh, there is places where we know there's a lot of, a lot of TV cases because uh, they get registered at the centers de salud which are like uh, uh, little community clinics so we have three community clinics detected that they have most of the TV cases in TJ. So we we distribute these materials close to them so that people know uh, at least what's what's your closest. And also in Las Memorias, we opened Las Memorias since 1999. Las Memorias have been open since 1999. And in 1999, we had nothing. We, Open Las Memorias with just taking care of one patient. Well, right now, uh, Las Memorias takes care of 120, 130 patients at, at any time. 
they live at the house. It's a house, actually, it's not a clinic, it's not a hospital, it's a, an albergue. It's a, a, a place where people can live. They come with, uh, with a disease, they come with HIV or TB, but uh, uh, when they come, we, we have a lab, we have grown since uh, 2014. We, uh, we open up a lab at the albergue in order to be able to do TB detections faster because we saw that uh, we had a lot of people with TB. I'm going to talk about it in a little while. And we can do at this lab, we can do acid fast staining. We still, as I told you, we, we rely a lot on, uh, on this staining for the TB detection. In TJ, we can do also hepatic function and basic microbiology testing. And actually, this is uh, what I'm presenting. This is the lab where I'm staying right now. And you can see uh, Dr. Nidia, who is also uh, listening to the presentation, doing some of the tests for the patients at this lab, lab memorial. Also, for TV control, since uh, 2019, while the COVID pandemic was hitting everyone, we we worked and, and were able to open up the four isolation rooms uh, to isolate people with uh, infectious disease from the rest of the people at the house, from the rest of people at memorials. And uh, this place can house up to 12 active infectious disease patients. And right here, we give, we give a dot, we get directly observed therapy for TB and also for HIV. And right here, you can see the, the place, you can see a, a section of the blueprint, how it is. There's four uh, isolations with one uh, uh, bathroom each and one uh, exclusa. Not the name of it, it's in, in English, but uh, the lab is right here at this place. And this is one of the rooms uh, of the isolation. And um, we have TV control. We, we do TV control with a team of volunteers uh, uh, guided by Dr. Park, who is also going to present in a little while. We have a visit from them every three weeks, uh, two weeks sometimes, or, or a little bit more. Uh, and they come to, to Las Memorias and they uh, do the, they do the, uh, the, uh, uh, they look uh, medically for, uh, for the signs, symptoms, they do the medical uh, uh, evaluation, sorry, they make the medical evaluation of the patients and they give us uh, the, um, the notes that we, all the tests, uh, laboratory tests we have to do and for the patients we perform, so me and Nidia, Dr. Nidia perform the test and uh, we give the results and Dr. Park and Dr. Robert and, uh, and other doctors that have been here too, um, they uh, tell us uh, what medications they should start. This way we have been able to start medications quickly for patients. And, um, and it's been of great help for people at Memorials, the visits from the team of volunteers, doctor volunteers helping us. It's been of great help. I know Dan is gonna talk about it in a little bit. So uh, we have detected uh, since the beginning of London, what we have detected, and it's been pretty active, uh, things that we have to improve and we have to do faster. Uh, Rotary uh, helped us build the first isolation room in 2013. And right here, the, the plaque, the, the sign they left at, uh, of this building, this old building we used to use for TV isolation, which was not a an actual isolate, isolation room. The ones that we built in 2019, they are equipped with, uh, with, uh, with the things needed for the complete isolation of uh, patients. On average, there are 15 to 25 patients with TV memorials at any time. 
If you travel, you can find 15 to 25 people are being treated for TB at the house. We have around uh, 120, 130 people living in the house. 16 to 20 percent of the of the incoming residents, when they get in, they have active TB. Uh, in 2014. At UABC, we uh, started monitoring TV at the memorials. We built a small lab to be able to do acid fast staining and other tests. And we started uh, to uh, monitor TV at the memorials. In 2016, two years after that, we saw that 25% of the, of the people diagnosed with TB died before the treatment was initiated. So this opened our, our eyes, and this opened our minds, and we said this is a really high incidence of, of mortality on one on population. And we started to, to work on the things that are already running at Las Memorias and the lab at UABC. In 2019, with the new Las Memorias lab and the isolation rooms, patients can be diagnosed, sheltered, and receive treatment and support services um, um, faster. Still, we need we need uh, more. We need to do things faster, but um, we need to increase the uh, decrease. I mean, we need to decrease the time uh, for the people when they come here. So we need to be out. We need. Uh, we think that we have to go out and find people, not stay. Uh, Las Memorias and be waiting for them because because still we have a lot of people dying before they get treatment. We have had people get into Las Memorias and die two two hours after they arrive. This is this is something we we probably can change if we do something to is to be at the place where they are before they get they get here. And we're thinking about going that in that direction. And this is some of the data we have uh, collected during the years since 2017, all the people that have entered Las Memorias and the uh, red numbers are the people who have died at Las Memorias. And we have, uh, we have since 1999, we have attended about 4,476 4, people. We have had uh, 1,056 people died at the house. Most of them are due to tuberculosis. And this is our, these are some of the characteristics of the people with TB that attended, that got attention of the memorials uh, from 2018 and 2021. We were looking at how COVID uh, Hit it, hit it, uh, people at the memorials, and we are uh, analyzing that data. So we have 77% um, are men, 22% are women. Uh, we have people from all over Mexico, and we have people from other parts of uh, Mexico from the outside. As a matter of fact, we even have people from the US. Right now we have a, a, a woman from the US, a US citizen, I don't know. I, we haven't found a way to get her back into the US, but she's been here for probably a month. And, uh, um, and the scholarity, the, and we have a, from, from, this is the distribution we have from the all Mexican states. Most of the people, one third of the people who are attended at the memorials are from the state of Baja, uh, Sinaloa, and uh, in, uh, it, it, Sinaloa has 9.9% uh, of the people are, come from Sinaloa and 7.7% .7 come from uh, Guerrero. Those three states are the places that uh, that we attend more, more people from the, from those places. The epidemiology of uh, people with TB, 9% have diabetes, 58% of people have HIV, um, malnutrition, 
uh, a little bit over half of the people, 53% have malnutrition, COVID. This is the percent of the people who got here during those years got COVID, and COVID was only here from 19 and, and forward, so not not since 19. Uh, actually, in Tijuana, the first cases were like in, in the 20, 2020, 2020. So, uh, but we have had. Uh, and we have seen that the worst that can happen is uh, people who have TB get COVID. We have only seen one of them survive. All of them have died. Uh, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, um, uh, cancer, and other other things that we have seen um, that uh, they have diseases they have uh, addictions we see that most of them are uh, alcoholics 97 percent of people are alcoholics uh, also 97 percent uh, smoke and 89 percent uh, use drugs and this is the type of drugs they use 19 percent use heroin uh, 94 percent use crystal meth 67 percent use marijuana Cocaine 12% and fentanyl 13.6%. Uh, the methodologies we have been able to use to diagnose the disease from them is um, the acid fast staining, 95% of the people. Genesper, only 16.3%. Uh, Culture, lowest in Jensen, 3.4%. People who have got uh, sensitivity testing, uh, there's only 3.4% of the people. And the uh, type of tuberculosis we have on, on the people we attend, we have is uh, pulmonary, 96%. Uh, um, lymph nodes, Infected by TB is uh, 4.8%. Uh, meningitis is 3.4%. Pleura is 1.4%. One, 1. And Miller and TB pleura is a little less than 1%. And well, that's it for the presentation. This is the, the what I have to present. Yeah, it might be okay to. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. I think it's uh, very interesting. You can see how uh, Professor Chavez Mendez's laboratory work has taken him into this setting, which is clearly a very difficult, demanding setting. But what he's done is build a laboratory, start to produce facilities that people need, and document what is going on. Um, so it does if. What we'd like to do is to hold some questions on Dr. Uh, Professor Chavez's uh, presentation. And then after that, um, Robert Dice and Dan Park are going to talk a little more about Las Memorias and you'll have the opportunity to ask the more clinical questions. Does anyone have any questions for Professor Chavez Mendez right now based on what he said? Uh, actually, Roman, I have a question for you. You can hear me, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so so you know when you did your chronic conditions and you know what people come in with, there was a very high percentage, obviously, of HIV TB TB co infection. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, able to provide antiretrovirals to those patients or not? Yes, yes, they are. Uh, they they all get uh, antiretrovirals in less than two weeks. Sometimes it takes longer, depending on the on the people and the patient. But uh, most of them get retrovirals really fast. Okay. Um, with the basis of, uh, I like to say it because it's really important to say it, with the basis of Dr. Park and Dr. Robert and the, the group of volunteers. It's been, uh, that time has been lower a uh, lot and people have been better. 
that's that that's incredible and they're going to talk more about that in a minute they're going to do in your isolation rooms your tb isolation rooms the photograph you showed you had four people in one room are you putting people are you able to distinguish between a multi-drug resistant tb and um to isolate the multi-drug resistance or not yet mm, we only are capable of doing uh gene expert only for brief resistance and uh and we do it clinically we see that the acid fasting lowers the 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 number of uh bacteria that that get into the that we can see on the microscope we we think that it's uh the medication is working so uh, we have we have not uh, completely been able to do it, but uh, since we get a lot of people with TB, this is the best we can do. Yeah, no, no, it's impressive. There's questions on the thing. Uh, we have two questions. I also have a question. Sonia, do you want to go ahead with your question? Yes. Well, first, I want to commend Roman and all the team. This is amazing the work that you're doing and, and the data that you're presenting. I have a question regarding the binationality of, of the individuals that are, are there housing Las Memorias. You mentioned that right now there's only one person that you that is US citizen, but I remember in the past that you, you have also said that there is a lot of uh, connections between the uh, the patients and the families and previous travels some of some of them have even lived in the in the US have you are you capturing any of that and how are you handling the binational contacts we have uh, about 80% of the people uh, probably 80 Five percent of people are, uh, have been uh, into the memorials, uh, lived in the U.S. illegally, and they uh, end up in uh, in Tijuana with us. And um, um, how how we how we uh, and they have families, people with with uh, that get attended at, at the memorial have families that live in the U.S. We have have. Some cases we actually had a case with uh, a TB resistant case that uh, his family came from the U.S. and, and, and got contact with him, and then the, we had to find the family in the U.S. to be able to for the for the uh, medical department at the city where they live to be able to do tests uh, on them. So uh, it's it's been it's been it, the people uh, who live in Tijuana. It's uh, actually uh, we we have a lot of content and we have a lot of ways in which um, the disease can travel along the border. You know, there's no actually there's no border for TV in, in, in between the two cities. Thank you very much, Roman. I have a quick question, and then we have several other questions in the chat. So one of them, yeah. OK. OK, so let's, Nettie, do you want to ask a question? You know, the first part of the question was was answered. Thank you. Um, I also want to commend the fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and I was uh, I'd asked to see a slide again, but in the interest of time, maybe I could see it later just to look at the various breakdown of deaths. I thought that was quite interesting information. And then um, just wanted to make the comment that with so much co-infection of HIV and TB, if we could improve, you know, HIV outreach prevention, a lot of these TB cases would have been prevented. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask you one quick question, Roman, and that's when you did your uh, slide of what's happening to people and what their comorbidities are, you had trauma, but you had physical trauma. You didn't have mention of psychological trauma. And I'm just wondering if you could add that to your uh, screening, because it's highly likely that a lot of people have had su substantial trauma and that 
affects their ability to be able to participate in treatment and to be able to take care of themselves. Just a comment. Thank you. And I'm going to hand over to Robert Dice. And I might just hand it over to Daniel Park, who's um, uh, just in the interest of time. He's uh, uh, did his fellowship here at uh, UC San Diego. So welcome back. Daniel, I was fortunate to meet him after one of our recent high rounds. So yay for high rounds. And, um, and uh, he's doing great work and really has introduced a lot of us to Las Memorias. Um, Daniel is a physician at San Isidro Health. Uh, one uh, who Nettie uh, uh, at San Isidro called one of the best kept secrets in San Diego um, and uh, one of the best physicians that we have. So um, Daniel, thank you for agreeing to uh, speak with us and uh, and present your work on, on Las Memorias. Okay. Yeah, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be back at UCSD. So I did my infectious disease fellowship here and now I'm at San Isidro Health where I uh, primarily do HIV and uh, TB. So we do see a lot of TB and the majority of it is from uh, Mexico. Um, and as Roman alluded to, it's a stark difference between getting diagnosed with TB in San Diego and uh, getting diagnosed in, with TB in Tijuana. Um, so uh, a lot of resources for our patients here and even uh, patients who are diagnosed and start treatment here who move to Tijuana, the county still has programs available to assist patients in Tijuana. So even in Tijuana, you could be getting directly observed therapy and um, all the best support. Uh, but if you're from Tijuana, not able to cross and very limited support. So it's really a pleasure to have uh, started working with Albergue Las Mores. It's an incredible organization. They're doing life-saving, life-changing work. Um, com completely grassroots, community-led. So uh, it was started by people living with substance use disorder, saw that there was no place for people with HIV uh, to go. And so just starting from a field in a, in a little hut shack, basically, and they've expanded services and whenever they see a need, they just try to address those needs. So every single person there pretty much is someone who has lived through substance use and a uh, majority of the staff are people who came there with substance use disorder, uh, uh, got clean, got support and stayed on um, and continued to uh, devote their lives really to the community and they live on site. Um, they have no formal government support, no formal financial support. It's all donations month to month. Roman pays a lot of bills out of his own salary just because there's no other options. Um, so really the inspiring work that I, so Roman gave you a big, uh, an overview. I wanna talk to you about individual cases that I think kind of illustrate the challenges that people there um, face in trying to receive quality medical care. And, uh, some of the obstacles they have and, and how we're trying to overcome those. How do I advance? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we have a medical team of volunteers. Usually we have a, about four to six people who go down. We go down once or twice a month, usually on the first Saturday of the month. We have physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, pharmacists. So uh, Dr. Carla Torres, uh, who is a uh, physician trained at UABC in Tijuana, former um, O1 provider here, uh, has been a key part of our team. Um, and from UCSD, uh, uh, Dr. Robert Dice and then Francisco Guetta, who's the ID fellow from AHF, the AHF has been a great support, come on recently to really help us with medications, with uh, um, organizing and, and trying to uh, plan some of the stuff we wanna do in the future. So Katie Savias is a pharmacist and the pharmacy supervisor, Leila Goring, and from San Ysidro, myself and Martha Ibarra is a nurse practitioner. Uh, we always need more volunteers, so I'm always trying to recruit people. So, you know, from all uh, health professionals and even just uh, layperson, anyone who is willing to just uh, spend some time, um, there's always some work to be done and that uh, can be helpful. From uh, the Tijuana side, Dr. Nidia uh, Alejandra Castillo-Martinez is a microbiologist from what they say. She's come on in the last year and has really ramped up our diagnostic capabilities, uh, has been amazing in helping us to make some diagnoses that we would not have been able to do um, without her work. Um, she's actually doing a sabbatical year and spending 100% full time at uh, Las Memorias. So the day-to-day -day care at Las Memorias is done by residents who um, 
yeah, I came there, got, uh, got help and decided to stay on and committed to the cause. Uh, no formal training, no formal education, but they're doing all the day-to-day -day nursing. So that's just uh, incredible work they're doing. So what do we see when we go down as volunteers? So there's a wide range. We deal with urgent care to primary care. So diarrhea, rash, back pain, um, headaches, uh, to just diabetes, hypertension. But really we focus on uh, people with advanced AIDS and TB. So patients come in and really, really bad condition, very severely ill. Um, and so that's where the most of our time is, is spent. Uh, so Albergue is not a hospice. So Albergue doesn't mean hospice. I, I actually thought it meant hospice when I first went there. That's just because it seemed like everybody was a hospice patient. Um, but then I realized that's no, not a hospice was not meant to be. It's a shelter. Albergue actually also means refuge uh, and harbor, which I, I really like those definitions. Um, so people, how do they arrive there? So people are discharged from the local hospitals, often very terribly ill. And uh, we go through the discharge summary and often I see this term, uh, alcanzo beneficio maximo, which basically means maximum benefit reached. So the hospital has determined basically the patient's hospice care, but doesn't talk to the patient about it and discharge the last memorias um, with the thought that they've done all they could or are willing to do for this patient. Uh, often patients come from home or from the street where they've been abandoned by their families and in terrible situations of neglect. So at uh, Las Morris, the staff, again, is not trained for hospice care. It's very intense work. They provide the best support and care they can. I think uh, the most valuable thing maybe they can do is provide a cup in a minute at the end of life so these patients can die with some sense of dignity uh, with, in a and be cared for in a compassionate and caring manner. There are very big obstacles for pain management. So pain management, uh, so narcotics are very strictly controlled, very difficult to get. These patients are sent out with terrible pain with no pain medications. Um, but I think all this can lead to burnout for the staff there. Uh, and we have seen some people who really, I think burnt out and ended up relapsing, going back to the street. Uh, it's extremely unfortunate. So uh, Sarah's working on, and we're working on trying to get partnered with hospice programs. Hopefully we can bring down some training and support uh, to help them to deal with you know, these very uh, intense situations. So uh, I wanted to present uh, one uh, case. So Sarah was, uh, Patient, uh, she was contacted. Oh, the director of Las Moras, named Antonio Guerrero, got a text from someone in Sonata, said, there's this very unfortunate woman. Um, can you help her? So he got a text message with the photo. And so this is how Sarah was living, um, had been neglected and in this terrible condition for quite some time. So uh, Senor Guerrero jumped in his van, took some staff, drove down to Ensenada and, and picked her up brought her back to Las Memorias. So in Las Memorias, you know, she arrived very ill. She had had very bad experiences, uh, I think with the healthcare system and refused to go to the emergency room, did not wanna go. Um, contractures, upper, lower extremities. Uh, at that point, um, you know, we just did what we could for her to help her be comfortable. Um, and she did pass away shortly after but uh you know, sometimes we get these heartwarming stories from the staff so uh, after uh, uh a few days apparently she had a moment of lucidity and, and sat up and woke up and said i am so happy and then she shortly thereafter passed away um so this is the kind of work that they do so this is the uh the the rooms where we house the patients with uh with different illnesses uh, when they arrive when they're sick. So it's, we call, I call it our infirmary. Um, it's uh, 12 beds, very crowded, not the best hygiene, constant battle with flies and mosquitoes. So I hate flies and I'm constantly taking stuff down to try and kill the flies. Uh, it doesn't work. So those electric fly swatters aren't very effective. They sell these lights that supposedly attract the flies. Those don't work very well either. Um, so ongoing battle. Uh, this is the old TB ward. Um, again, was very crowded, but we're working on that to make that situation better. We'll arrive Saturday morning. 
there'll usually be three or four people who've arrived recently who are in bad shape. So we'll split up the team and go just make bedside rounds. Often there's people on the floor for lack of space. Um, so Pabla, she was a 45 year old female with HIV. She'd been off treatment for several years. She had come to Las Morales with several months of cough, severe diarrhea, severe weight loss. Uh, she's homeless, methamphetamine use. On exam, she was very cachectic, hypoxic, a bad thrush. She really couldn't ambulate without any assistance and very slowed cognition, but she also declined to be sent to the ER. Um, and this is a very common experience. So patients report that they've really been mistreated by the health system and don't wanna go back. The ER and the hospitals, they are overworked, overcrowded. Um, we have had patients sit for 24 hours or more waiting to be seen in a chair in the waiting room. These are very ill patients who you know, really can't sit for that long. Um, a lot of times they just get fed up and ask to be brought back to Las Mordias. Uh, there's a, still a lot of stigma, so a lot of stories of yeah, patients being uh, mistreated, talking, being talked to in a very disrespectful way because of their condition. Um, so since she didn't want to go to the ER, we just do a, you know, we made an evaluation and, and did what we can at Las Primordias with our limited diagnostics and medications. We approach things in a syndromic manner. So looking at what their complaints are, what the most likely diagnoses are, and what can we do right there. So for her, she is hypoxic. Um, you know, respiratory symptoms, we're always basically looking at TB, uh, pneumocystis, and, and whether there's a secondary bacterial pneumonia. So uh, for her, we recommend that she get uh, AFB stains done. Dr. Nidia, and now we are able to do some stool microscopy. She had really severe diarrhea. Um, and then uh, we, so we recommend working her up for TB, treating her for pneumocystis pneumonia, giving her some low pyramid for thrush. And uh, so her sputum AFBs were, were negative. Uh, negative. Uh. We were uh, unable to get chest x-rays. He's just too sick to transport. But uh, Nidia was awesome, was able to do her stool. It showed heavy AFB. And we were fortunately able to send that to a local NGO across town who was able to do a gene expert for us. And that showed that patient had tuberculosis. Um, we did start her on a TB treatment and she actually improved. So, uh, and uh, she eventually did accept hospitalization. So she was sent to the hospital admitted and actually I think she's doing, doing better, but still in the hospital. Uh, her case illustrates some of the challenges we have and, and uh, Dr. Chavez has gone over some of these. So it's really difficult to make TB diagnosis. It's difficult in the US especially in people with advanced immune suppression, it's hard to find the bacilli. Um, we often have to you know, resort to biopsies and we still end up not getting the diagnosis. So in that setting, it's even harder. So the AFB smear that Dr. Chavez was referring to is extremely low sensitivity, so less than 50% and probably less than that, certainly less than that in people with HIV AIDS. So we're relying on smear to make the diagnosis. We're missing at least half the cases. Uh, Chest X-ray can be helpful, but um, there's uh, issues with cost, logistics. Um, and then the gene expert would be really a game changer to have at Las Morias. Uh, it, it really would increase our, our ability to make the diagnosis and to do it in a very fast manner. The late diagnoses have a negative impact on the patient, increased mortality, so high mortality because we're treating so late. And then in a place like Las Morias, that brings infection control issues. So, patients come with these syndromes. We don't know if it's TB, we don't have, we're not able to separate everyone that comes. So often you're housing people with TB with the other people with, um, with AIDS. So not a good scenario. Um, other barriers to care. So I guess you might ask, why don't we just send these people to the clinics or aren't there resources available? So uh, again, stigma. So patients don't wanna go. Uh, we see a lot of deportees and migrants who don't have the proper paperwork. So they can't be seen immediately. Um, and uh, we've had the ambulance refuse to transport our patients. Uh, we've had patients turned away by the hospital. So just quickly on the, uh, where are we at time? Uh, oh, okay. all right, yeah. So uh, I'm gonna skip this. So this is the expert. It was basically it, we would help us to make uh, instant diagnosis at Las Morales within two hours on a molecular-based test. Um, so. Irma was a 30 year old uh, female sex worker with HIV substance use. And she has this history of this very large left neck mass. 
So she's actually been dealing with this for several years, but um, she comes in and out of Las Morias, uh, gets treated very for a short period, feels better, goes back to the streets. And she's also gone to private doctors to get treatment. So she's had uh, improper treatment of her TB and treatment interruptions. So this time she came in sicker than previously. Uh, this mass just kept growing very quickly. She started developing dyspnea and dysphagia. And uh, we, we uh, just eventually performed the IND and sent the material for AFB stain and also to try and get an expert on it. So we were lucky in her case, we were able to get it to the nonprofit and um, it did come back with TB and actually came back with rifampin resistance. And after much uh, wrangling, we actually were able to get a sample to the state TB lab and it confirmed her um, rifampin resistance. Roman then was eventually able to grow it in his lab. Uh, we were able to get her into the MDR clinic at uh, Hospital General. She was given a, a all oral uh, regimen, WHO approved regimen, um, and she attended clinic for about a month and spoke to her at length about the seriousness of her condition. And you know, she was very motivated to stay in care, but eventually she did leave again. So she's defaulted and unable to be located. Uh, we're trying to locate her uh, in the streets. So TB treatment default is a frequent challenge. A lot of our patients do come and go. Um, obviously not ideal for a, a TB uh, programmatic aspect. This is a big area of focus for us. Um, hope to implement a promotora community health worker project so that we can support these patients even if they go back into the street that we can keep them in care, take the medications, keep an eye on them, and hopefully improve outcomes. So the, just a warning, the next photo is a little bit graphic. So if you kind of have a weak stomach, maybe you don't want to look, but I think it was important to include some of these pictures just so that you have a sense of how severely ill some of these patients are and that untrained uh, non-healthcare professionals are providing this day-to-day -day care for this level of, of acuity. Um, so a wound care is a big deal. We see a lot of skin abscesses. So this woman was sent in with these horrible wounds. She had gone undergone extensive IND at the hospital. This is her elbow. She had other uh, sites just like this, uh, like on her leg, on her other arm. Um, so she was determined to have beneficios maximos. That's the best they could do for her, apparently. Sent her out with no wound care materials, no pain medications, and just to go to Las Memorias like this. So uh, often I'll get a text. So you know, we, this patient arrived from the hospital with this condition, what can we do for? Um, so I'll just get on Amazon and order wound supply cares and whatever we can get and take down, um, you know, all the, uh, or, or gather stuff from the clinic and, and, and just try to do the best we can. So we'll get people post-operative with post-operative infections or just like this patient had a AKA and post-op day one discharged to Las Memorias. Uh, people with colostomies sent with no colostomy supplies. So we'll get on Amazon and order some colostomy supplies. Pa many patients with decubitus ulcers. Um, sometimes we just have to use the kitchen sink approach. So, uh, so the 28 year old male, HIV, off antiretroviral is brought in by his family with confusion, fever, cough. On exam, he's really confused. Uh, temperature 102, pulse 130, hypoxic. We called the hospital, this was during COVID. So one hospital was full, the other hospital was also pretty much full and their advice was to give him oxygen and monitor. Uh, um, so while Robert and I were discussing the case, Roman snuck off and, and did an AFB. Um, it came back four plus uh, positive. Uh, so at that point we just decided, you know, well, we're gonna treat him for everything. So started uh, ripe for TB meningitis with prednisone. He's hypoxic, so I had to start treat him for Bactrim, give him my fluid, IV fluids, you know, uh, high uh, risk of bacterial uh, infection in people with advanced HIV. So um, we went ahead and gave him ceftriaxone and IM. Um, remarkably, the patient had a rapid improvement. And when we came back the next visit, he was sitting up in bed, uh, completely lucid, doing great, continues to improve. Yeah. Uh, so I like this quote from Paul Farmer. 
he's speaking about his early work in Haiti. So no, our work wasn't great or even very good. It was really quite bad without the staff, stuff, space, and systems. How can you do good work in a medical wasteland, a clinical desert? I don't think you can. And uh, you know, Roman presented the high mortality, and I, you know, um, they are doing amazing social work. They are doing everything they can as non-healthcare professionals. From as a, from a healthcare professional standpoint, we're not doing very good work, um, but. You know, we're doing the best we can in trying to address some of these issues. Um, and this is a photo from across the street of Las Memorias. So I just really like this picture. Uh, so they gave me some data. So from September 2020 to January 2021, so four month period, they ran 114 uh, smears or, or patients. 37 patients were positive by smear. So how many of these had smear negative TB? Probably a large proportion, 38% mortality among this group. So just extremely high mortality rate. Uh, so our staff is really one of the things I'm concerned about the most. Um, I really worry about their burnout. They're on 24 seven, they live there with the patients. So uh, what we, we would like to provide them with some nursing assistant classes. We would like to provide them with salaries. Uh, and then a lot of the residents are really excited about, about uh, working like this. And we would like to get RNs to come and hopefully provide some training and, and, and including hospice. Uh, a lot of uh, stuff that, we, that would help, including the MTB uh, expert. Um, and then as far as space, you see the conditions that the patients are in. So we are, they have completed a new TV unit. So Specialists in Global Health is a nonprofit that Sarah Brown founded, uh, focused on training medical professionals in the developing world for long-term success. And you can go to this website and support the college. You can specifically support Las Memorias as well um, if you mark that in your donation. Uh, but they built this by hand, basically. Residents were out there digging in the dirt in like 100 degree weather in the summer and we we're treating people for dehydration. Uh, but they built this beautiful unit with the lab. It's just uh, remarkable compared to what we had before. Um, so back to uh, the picture. So this says, no tirar basura, don't throw trash. So you know, there's this big trash heap and somebody decided they're going to put up a sign. So this to me shows like somebody had just unrelenting optimism that you can put up a sign, don't throw your trash out. So uh, that is what I see also at Las Moria. So in the environment they're working on, I think the biggest challenge can be not succumbing to cynicism and nihilism uh, among like the, the many challenges, but I never get that sense at last morning. This, all I see is uh, optimism, positivity, and like a can-do spirit. So that is uh, something that is very infectious. And so I, I really love working there. Uh, so a Paul Farmer quote, so sadly Paul Farmer passed away recently. Um, pioneer in global health, but he said, the idea that some li lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong with the world. And uh, Las Memorias really embodies that because they bring people in, they see them at their worst uh, condition and provide them with love and support. And then we see remarkable transformation. So Joseph you know, was brought in, uh, HIV advanced TB, uh, was determined to have maximum benefit from the hospital, but um, with the support of Las Memorias, he was able to get treated. He stayed on at Las Memorias, and now he is studying to be a lab tech. He's performing the, the AFB smears at Las, Las Memorias. So I think it's just a, a wonderful story. And same thing with Hill. Um, he's one of our main resident assistants. He works nonstop, sends me vital signs all day long, and uh, you know is, is doing everything. And he's so excited to be able to hopefully enter a nursing assistant program and get more training. Um, so if you're interested in volunteering, uh, please like, contact me. Uh, it truly is a refuge. We can use all the help we can. And uh, Robert has such a big heart. He brings in all the stray animals. So yeah, thank you for your attention and uh, any uh, questions. Um, yeah, are there any questions in the audience? Um, I know it's 9.03, so, but we're all here in person. We can party afterwards, I guess, right? <laughs> what are we doing next? Um, anything in the chat? Uh, Daniel's looking through it. Kitchen sink approach. Okay, so is there a collaboration between Las Amorias, UABC, and 
you say Salud in regards to the lab, mainly possibly that drug specificity testing could be done at you say Salud. Roman, maybe you can speak to that better. Yes, that, there is the collaboration with this Salud. We we get uh, help a lot, a lot of help from Dr. Luis Garcia, which is the the head of the bacteria program in Tijuana. So um, we share a lot of, uh, of information, uh, resources. Um, sometimes they need, sometimes we need, and uh, we get a, we have a, a really good collaboration with them as a friendship. Also, I like to say that the, whenever we we need something, um, Dr. Luis Garcia makes it possible really fast. Oh, Devery had a question about ARVs. So we collect, donate ARVs uh, to be compatible with DAPA. We usually give Tivike. So uh, if you collect any unused bottles of Tivike, that's always a big need if anyone has uh, donations. Um, okay, I think. Okay, yeah. That's it. We can thank everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, thank you very much for attending. I think it's a really remarkable uh, presentation. It just shows you, you know, the needs. And uh, I think the other thing that's important is if everybody works together. Often these situations look totally overwhelming and people just sort of walk away because as Dan said, there's burnout. However, at this moment in time, if you've noticed, there is now a group movement. So you can join a club. And if you, when you join the club, you will be with others and you will not be alone and people can support each other. So um, as Dan mentioned, there are ways to donate. You can go onto the SAI website and if you donate and you put Las Memorias, you know that your donation goes to Las Memorias. But I think further discussion with Robert and Dan, who are really the experts on what's going on and they, with Roman, are categorizing needs and I think those are really the people to contact uh, and discuss if you have interest or colleagues or connections that can help them get what they're looking for. Thank you so much for attending our first live rounds. Thanks very much, Roman. Thanks, Dan. Thank you.